Section 9 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Susan Seibel. Myths Every Child Should Know. Edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 9. The Gorgon's Head, Part 1. Perseus was the son of Danae, who was the daughter of a king, and when Perseus was a very little boy, some wicked people put his mother and himself into a chest and set them afloat upon the sea. The wind blew freshly and drove the chest away from the shore, and the uneasy billows tossed it up and down, while Danae clasped her child closely to her bosom and dreaded that some big wave would dash its foamy crest over them both. The chest sailed on, however, and neither sank nor was upset until, when night was coming, it floated so near an island that it got entangled in a fisherman's nets and was drawn out high and dry upon the sand. The island was called Seraphus, and it was reigned over by King Polydectes, who happened to be the fisherman's brother. This fisherman, I am glad to tell you, was an exceedingly humane and upright man. He showed great kindness to Danae and her little boy, and continued to befriend them, until Perseus had grown to be a handsome youth, very strong and active, and skillful in the use of arms. Long before this time, King Polydectus had seen the two strangers, the mother and her child, who had come to his dominions in a floating chest. As he was not good and kind like his brother the fisherman, but extremely wicked, he resolved to send Perseus on a dangerous enterprise in which he would probably be killed, and then to do some great mischief to Danae herself. So this bad-hearted king spent a long while in considering what was the most dangerous thing that a young man could possibly undertake to perform. At last, having hit upon an enterprise that promised to turn out as fatally as he desired, he sent for the youthful Perseus. The young man came to the palace and found the king sitting upon his throne. Perseus, said King Polydectes, smiling craftily upon him, you are grown up a fine young man. You and your good mother have received a great deal of kindness from myself, as well as from my worthy brother the fisherman, and I suppose you will not be sorry to repay some of it. Please, your majesty, answered Perseus, I would willingly risk my life to do so. Well then, continued the king, still with a cunning smile on his lips, I have a little adventure to propose to you, and, as you are a brave and enterprising youth, you will doubtless look upon it as a great piece of good luck to have so rare an opportunity of distinguishing yourself. You must know, my good Perseus, I think of getting married to the beautiful princess Hippodamia, and it is customary on these occasions to make the bride a present of some far-fetched and elegant curiosity. I have been a little perplexed, I must honestly confess, where to obtain anything likely to please a princess of her exquisite taste. But this morning, I flatter myself, I have thought of precisely the article. And can I assist your majesty in obtaining it? cried Perseus eagerly. You can, if you are as brave a youth as I believe you to be, replied King Polydectes, with the utmost graciousness of manner. The bridal gift which I have set my heart on presenting to the beautiful Hippodamia is the head of the Gorgon Medusa, with the snaky locks, and I depend on you, my dear Perseus, to bring it to me. So, as I am anxious to settle affairs with the princess, the sooner you go in quest of the Gorgon, the better I shall be pleased. I will set out to-morrow morning, answered Perseus. Pray do so, my gallant youth, rejoined the king. And Perseus, in cutting off the gorgon's head, be careful to make a clean stroke so as not to injure its appearance. You must bring it home in the very best condition in order to suit the exquisite taste of the beautiful princess Hippodamia. Perseus left the palace, but was scarcely out of hearing before Polydectes burst into a laugh, being greatly amused, wicked king that he was, to find how readily the young man fell into the snare. The news quickly spread abroad that Perseus had undertaken to cut off the head of Medusa with the snaky locks. Everybody was rejoiced, for most of the inhabitants of the island were as wicked as the king himself, and would have liked nothing better than to see some enormous mischief happen to Danae and her son. The only good man in this unfortunate island of Seraphis appears to have been the fisherman. As Perseus walked along, therefore, the people pointed after him and made mouths and winked to one another and ridiculed him as loudly as they dared. Ho, ho, cried they, Medusa's snakes will sting him soundly. 
Now there were three Gorgons alive at that period, and they were the most strange and terrible monsters that had ever been since the world was made, or that have been seen in the after days, or that are likely to be seen in all time to come. I hardly know what sort of creature or hobgoblin to call them. They were three sisters, and seemed to have borne some distant resemblance to women, but were really a very frightful and mischievous species of dragon. It is indeed difficult to imagine what hideous beings these three sisters were, why instead of locks of hair, if you can believe me, they had each of them a hundred enormous snakes growing on their heads, all alive, twisting, wriggling, curling, and thrusting out their venomous tongues with forked stings at the end. The teeth of the gorgons were terribly long tusks, their hands were made of brass, and their bodies were all over scales, which, if not iron, were something as hard and impenetrable. They had wings, too, and exceedingly splendid ones, I can assure you, for every feather in them was pure, bright, glittering, burnished gold, and they looked very dazzling, no doubt, when the gorgons were flying about in the sunshine. But when people happened to catch a glimpse of their glittering brightness aloft in the air, they seldom stopped to gaze but ran and hid themselves as speedily as they could, you will think, perhaps, that they were afraid of being stung by the serpents that served the gorgons instead of hair, or of having their heads bitten off by their ugly tusks, or of being all torn to pieces by their brazen claws. Well, to be sure, these were some of the dangers, but by no means the greatest, nor the most difficult to avoid. For the worst thing about these abominable gorgons was that, if once a poor mortal fixed his eyes full upon one of their faces, he was certain, that very instant, to be changed from warm flesh and blood into cold and lifeless stone. Thus, as you will easily perceive, it was a very dangerous adventure that the wicked King Polydectus had contrived for this innocent young man, Perseus himself, when he had thought over the matter, could not help seeing that he had very little chance of coming safely through it, and that he was far more likely to become a stone image than to bring back the head of Medusa with the snaky locks. For, not to speak of the other difficulties, there was the one which it would have puzzled an older man than Perseus to get over. Not only must he fight with and slay this golden-winged, iron-scaled, long-tusked, brazen-clawed, snaky-haired monster, but he must do it with his eyes shut or at least without so much as a glance at the enemy with whom he was contending. Else, while his arm was lifted to strike, he would stiffen into stone and stand with that uplifted arm for centuries, until time and the wind and weather should crumble him quite away. This would be a very sad thing to befall a young man who wanted to perform a great many brave deeds, and to enjoy a great deal of happiness in this bright and beautiful world. So disconsolate did these thoughts make him that Perseus could not bear to tell his mother what he had undertaken to do. He therefore took his shield, girded on his sword, and crossed over from the island to the mainland, where he sat down in a solitary place and hardly refrained from shedding tears. But while he was in this sorrowful mood, he heard a voice close beside him. Perseus, said the voice, why are you sad? He lifted his head from his hands in which he had hidden it, and behold, all alone, as Perseus had supposed himself to be, there was a stranger in the solitary place. It was a brisk, intelligent, and remarkably shrewd-looking young man with a cloak over his shoulders, an odd sort of cap on his head, a strangely twisted staff in his hand, and a short and very crooked sword hanging by his side. He was exceedingly light and active in his figure, like a person much accustomed to gymnastic exercises and well able to leap or run. Above all, the stranger had such a cheerful, knowing, and helpful aspect, though it was certainly a little mischievous into the bargain, that Perseus could not help feeling his spirits grow livelier as he gazed at him. Besides, being really a courageous youth, he felt greatly ashamed that anybody should have found him with tears in his eyes like a timid little schoolboy, when, after all, there might be no occasion for despair. So Perseus wiped his eyes and answered the stranger pretty briskly, putting on as brave a look as he could. I am not so very sad, he said, only thoughtful about an adventure that I have undertaken. Oh, ho, answered the stranger. Well, tell me all about it, and possibly I may be of service to you. I have helped a good many young men through adventures that looked difficult enough beforehand. Perhaps you may have heard of me. I have more names than one, but the name of Quicksilver suits me as well as any other. 
Tell me what the trouble is, and we will talk the matter over and see what can be done. The stranger's words and manners put Perseus into quite a different mood from his former one. He resolved to tell this Quicksilver all his difficulties, since he could not easily be worse off than he already was, and very possibly his new friend might give him some advice that would turn out well in the end. So he let the stranger know, in few words, precisely what the case was, how that King Polydectes wanted the head of Medusa with the snaky locks as a bridal gift for the beautiful Princess Hippodamia, and how he had undertaken to get it for him, but was afraid of being turned into stone. "'Ah, that would be a great pity,' said Quicksilver, with his mischievous smile. "'You would make a very handsome marble statue, it is true, and it would be a considerable number of centuries before you crumbled away. But on the whole, one would rather be a young man for a few years than a stone image for a great many.' "'Oh, far rather!' exclaimed Perseus, with the tears again standing in his eyes. "'And besides, what would my dear mother do if her beloved son were turned into a stone?' "'Well, well, let us hope that the affair will not turn out so very badly,' replied Quicksilver in an encouraging tone. "'I am the very person to help you, if anybody can. My sister and myself will do our utmost to bring you safe through the adventure, ugly as it now looks.' "'Your sister,' repeated Perseus. "'Yes, my sister,' said the stranger, "'she is very wise, I promise you, and as for myself, I generally have all my wits about me, such as they are. If you show yourself bold and cautious and follow our advice, you need not fear being a stone image yet a while. But, first of all, you must polish your shield till you can see your face in it as distinctly as in a mirror.' This seemed to Perseus a rather odd beginning of the adventure for he thought it of far more consequence that this shield should be strong enough to defend him from the gorgon's brazen claws than that it should be bright enough to show him the reflection of his face. However, concluding that Quicksilver knew better than himself, he immediately set to work and scrubbed the shield with so much diligence and goodwill that it very quickly shone like the moon at harvest time. Quicksilver looked at it with a smile and nodded his approbation. Then, taking off his own short and crooked sword, he girded it about Perseus, instead of the one which he had before worn. "'No sword but mine will answer your purpose,' observed he. "'The blade has a most excellent temper, and will cut through iron and brass as easily as through the slenderest twig, and now we will set out. The next thing is to find the three gray women, who will tell us where to find the nymphs.' "'The three gray women?' cried Perseus, to whom this seemed only a new difficulty in the path of his adventure. "'Pray, who may the three gray women be? I've never heard of them before.' "'They are three very strange old ladies,' said Quicksilver, laughing. "'They have but one eye among them, and only one tooth. Moreover, you must find them out by starlight or in the dusk of the evening, for they never show themselves by light either of the sun or moon.' But, said Perseus, why should I waste my time with these three gray women? Would it not be better to set out at once in search of the terrible Gorgons? No, no, answered his friend. There are other things to be done before you can find your way to the Gorgons. There is nothing for it but to hunt up these old ladies, and when we meet with them, you may be sure that the Gorgons are not a great way off. Come, let's be stirring." Perseus, by this time, felt so much confidence in his companion's sagacity that he made no more objections, and professed himself ready to begin the adventure immediately. They accordingly set out, and walked at a pretty brisk pace, so brisk, indeed, that Perseus found it rather difficult to keep up with his nimble friend Quicksilver. To say the truth, he had a singular idea that Quicksilver was furnished with a pair of winged shoes which, of course, helped him along marvelously. And then, too, when Perseus looked sideways at him out of the corner of his eye, he seemed to see wings on the side of his head, although if he turned a full gaze there were no such things to be perceived but only an odd kind of cap. But at all events the twisted staff was evidently a great convenience to Quicksilver and enabled him to proceed so fast that Perseus, though a remarkably active young man, began to be out of breath. Here, cried Quicksilver at last, for he knew well enough, rogue that he was, how hard Perseus found it to keep pace with him. Take you the staff, for you need it a great deal more than I. Are there no better walkers than yourself in the island of Seraphus? I could walk pretty well, said Perseus, glancing slyly at the companion's feet, if I had only a pair of winged shoes. We must see about getting you a pair, answered Quicksilver. But the staff helped Perseus along so bravely that he no longer felt the slightest weariness. In fact, the stick seemed to be alive in his hand, and to lend some of its life to Perseus. 
he and quicksilver now walked onward at their ease talking very sociably together and quicksilver told so many pleasant stories about his former adventures and how well his wits had served him on various occasions that perseus began to think him a very wonderful person he evidently knew the world and nobody is so charming to a young man as a friend who has that kind of knowledge perseus listened the more eagerly in the hope of brightening his own wits by what he heard at last he happened to recollect that quicksilver had spoken of a sister who was to lend her assistance in the adventure which they were now bound upon where is she he inquired shall we not meet her soon all at the proper time said his companion but this sister of mine you must understand is quite a different sort of character from myself she is very grave and prudent seldom smiles never laughs and makes it a rule not to utter a word unless she has something particularly profound to say neither will she listen to any but the wisest conversation dear me ejaculated perseus i shall be afraid to say a syllable she is a very accomplished person i assure you continued quicksilver and has all the arts and sciences at her fingers ends in short she is so immoderately wise that many people call her wisdom personified but to tell you the truth she has hardly vivacity enough for my taste and i think you would scarcely find her so pleasant a travelling companion as myself she has her good points nevertheless but you will find the benefit of them in your encounter with the gorgons by this time it had grown quite dusk they were now come to a very wild and desert place overgrown with shaggy bushes and so silent and solitary that nobody seemed ever to have dwelt or journeyed there all was waste and desolate in the gray twilight which grew every moment more obscure perseus looked about him rather disconsolately and asked quicksilver whether they had a great deal farther to go hist hist whispered his companion make no noise this is just the time and place to meet the three gray women be careful that they do not see you before you see them for though they have but a single eye among the three it is as sharp-sighted as half a dozen common eyes but what must i do asked perseus when we meet them quicksilver explained to perseus how the three gray women managed with their one eye they were in the habit it seems of changing it from one to the other as if it had been a pair of spectacles or which would have better suited them a quizzing glass when one of the three had kept the eye a certain time she took it out of the socket and passed it to one of her sisters whose turn it might happen to be and who immediately clapped it into her own head and enjoyed a peep at the visible world thus it will easily be understood that only one of the three gray women could see while the other two were in utter darkness and moreover at the instant when the eye was passed from hand to hand neither of the poor old ladies was able to see a wink i have heard of a great many strange things in my day and have witnessed not a few but none it seems to me can compare with the oddity of these three gray women all peeping through a single eye so thought perseus likewise and was so astonished that he almost fancied his companion was joking with him and that there were no such old women in the world you will soon find whether i tell the truth or no observed quicksilver hark hush hist hist there they come now perseus looked earnestly through the dusk of the evening and there sure enough at no great distance off he descried the three gray women the light being so faint that he could not well make out what sort of figures they were only he discovered that they had long gray hair and as they came nearer he saw that two of them had but the empty socket of an eye in the middle of their foreheads but in the middle of the third sister's forehead there was a very large bright and piercing eye which sparkled like a great diamond in a ring and so penetrating did it seem to be that perseus could not help thinking it must possess the gift of seeing in the darkest midnight just as perfectly as at noonday the sight of three persons eyes was melted and collected into that single one End of section nine.